What comes to mind when you hear the word Muslim? What automatic word associations do you make? For the six million plus Muslims in America, they're answering the question, what's it like to be Muslim in America today? In partnership with the American Leadership Forum, we bring you a conversation with three Sacramento area Muslims, Cheryl Miles, Mahin Ahmed, and Bassam El Kara, Executive Director for the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, Sacramento Valley, next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Bassam, what's it like to be a Muslim at this moment in America? We're probably undergoing the most challenging, difficult time for our community is to have your patriotism question, is to have your faith question, is to have your kids bullied, uh, is to have your house of worship vandalized, as we're seeing the biggest spike uh, in the history of our nation of mosque vandalisms around the nation, um, mosques burned down in Texas, uh, religious leaders being killed. And so it's, it's pretty serious right now, and unfortunately we're going through a challenging time, um, not only our community, but as a nation. Mahin, how is your life today compared to, say, a couple years ago? I think currently it's just this overwhelming feeling of knowing that people are looking at you in different ways. Um, currently wearing the headscarf, I didn't used to have, it's called the hijab in Arabic. I didn't think much of it um, beforehand in terms of feeling it, but currently um, you're kind of hypersensitive to just wearing it and representing your faith and um, how your community is dealing with it and the hate crimes that are occurring to Muslim women specifically because you can see us as Muslim. And, and that's interesting because, Cheryl, you're a Muslim as well. Uh, you don't wear the hijab, but how does the current environment impact you on a daily basis? Um, I have so many feelings about this, and it's a very distressing time. You know, I'm, um, my mother is Japanese. Uh, she was born here in this country. My grandmother was born here in this country. Um, in Japanese and my entire family was in the World War II concentration camps. My mother was three years old. And that was, um, you know, lack of political re leadership and racism. And to see us in the same position again now is just very distressing. I, I can't even describe it. So you're, you are part Japanese mm -hmm. and you have family members that went through internment. How, you know, with that lens from your own family history, what questions are on your mind right now as you survey the current environment? I don't really understand how we can be here again, or maybe I do understand how we can be here again. I mean, immigration um, is not new in this country and limiting immigration. We did 1924 with the Asian Exclusion Act. And here we are regressing back to 1924, the conditions under which the Asian Exclusion Act was um, passed and uh, affected people in California created the environment of um, racism that allowed the prejudice to happen and for the Japanese to be interned in um, on the West Coast, 120,000, most of them citizens, U.S. citizens. So it's, um, I try to say that, you know, this couldn't happen again but I'm very fearful that it could happen again. But with all due respect, uh, as opposed to Mahin, who wears a hijab every day, uh, you're a corporate executive. Uh, you look like a corporate executive that we might see on the street in any major city in, in the world. It would seem to me that, uh, that you know, you can go about your daily life and, and there's no uh, difference than anyone else. That's exactly right. It, that's exactly right. I mean, people look at me and they don't know who I am. You know, they wouldn't know that I'm Japanese. You wouldn't know that I'm a Muslim, right? So I can move freely. And it really disturbs me that other people can't. 
and it really disturbs me that um, people are uh, targeted f um, because of the way they look, um, because of the perception of who they are. Um, when people look at me, they really can't figure it out, and, and I really don't help them until they get to know me. And I have the luxury of being able uh, to get to know people before they know who I am. Um, Mahin, you wear a hijab, and people passing you by, they know who you are, and they know what you are, and there are repercussions for that. And I think it's terribly brave of you to be doing that now, but I actually really know that it's not just brave, it's who you are. Thank you. I, I mean, I think currently in this time frame, it's seen as, um, I, I don't like to see myself and Muslim women seen as victims when it comes to us, you know, like I chose to wear the headscarf. I chose to put it on every day. And um, I remember right after uh, elections, November 9th, you know, I put, on, I put on my brightest scarf because it was my act of um, rebellion, right? My act of resistance. And I think that's how I feel about Muslim women right now because we're proud of who we are and we're proud of our identities and I'm going to continue wearing it every day and I think it's up to other communities to change their perceptions and you know our political atmosphere right now is making it a difficult time for us but I think we're going to continue wearing it so that others can see who we really are. Now tell us a little bit about your story. You're um, uh, obvi obviously you know a a younger woman, okay. Um, tell us a little bit about, have you always been, uh, always worn the hijab, mm -hmm. or is this something you came to later in life? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was born in Los Angeles, and my family, uh, we weren't very religious at that time. Uh, my mom didn't wear it until later on in life, probably like a year or so before I began, and I began when I was 13. So we moved up to Sacramento. My dad is actually um, an Air Force veteran, U.S. Air Force veteran, and so um, he's, you know, our family's basically like I would like to say the typical American family, um, and Muslim at that too. When we started practicing more, um, so I started to learn more about my faith. I made the decision myself. My parents, um, they were actually kind of afraid for me to start wearing it. My mom, she didn't want me to just because of the hate that I would face. It was post 9-11. My dad was very supportive. Um, I'm the oldest of four sisters, so for me to take a stance to put on the headscarf, it's also um, inspiring, I would say, motivating for my younger sisters who started soon after I did. So. Um, that's kind of when I decided to put it on. Um, when I was 13, I learned more about my faith, and it's something that I feel it's a religious thing for me where I feel that this is my connection to God, and I see myself wearing it every day, and it's my reminder of my spirituality, and it's empowering for me. Um, but uh, that's that was pretty much my story. After that, I went to Catholic high school. I was the only student that used to wear it there, and currently now um, where I work, at the state capitol, I'm the only woman who wears a headscarf in the entire and, and building. And you're a Davis graduate? Yes, I'm a UC Davis graduate, yes. Okay, all right. Uh, Bassam, the, the, the moment that we're in right now with, uh, you know, executive, uh, with executive decisions, executive orders, uh, limiting access to this country, how is this impacting the families and individuals that you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, just, um, just yesterday we received four reports um, f from green card holders, um, three here, one overseas. The family overseas was in Yemen, um, where the father is a U.S. citizen, the mother is a green card holder, and the children are U.S. citizens. And they, they're afraid because um, they won't be allowed to come back with their mother. And so it's breaking up our families. Um, we're getting reports of U.S. citizens um, not being allowed to board flights um, fr from countries in Africa. U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens in Africa, in the Middle East, in other parts of the world. So unfortunately, it's, uh, it, you know, this is, this is pretty scary. I mean, you know, we never thought we would see this in our lifetimes where U.S. citizens are green card holders. We're a nation. We will say, you've got to do things the right way. You've got to go through the legal means. And here are folks that have their permanent residence, um, yet they're being denied um, entry into this country. And some of them were forced back, um, sent back on the plane and, and sent overseas. How do you respond to uh, the assertion that uh, the current order is really based on nations' be past behavior rather than r religion? Do you buy that? 
Um, you know, look, right now it's, it, it's clear what they're doing. I mean, Donald Trump was clear during the election season exactly what his policies are, what he's advocating for, advocating for the Muslim ban. So it's interesting to see the pundits today try to say, no, no, this has, it's not a Muslim ban. <laughs> he was saying it was a Muslim ban and he's going to implement it. Uh, Rudy, Rudy Giuliani came out recently and said that, yeah, he was asked to, to test, to put together the Muslim ban. And so, unfortunately, it's, it's playing out before our eyes. It's unconstitutional. Uh, there's lawsuits in place right now. And, and this is, we're having the biggest challenge to our democracy since the Civil War. Um, now, at that time, the champion of democracy was in the White House. But unfortunately, today, um, it's not, that's not those, the case. Those are, those are pretty strong words. And I want to ask you all the question. For, uh, for those that support this action, their statement is that we have to protect uh, America's security and that uh, their concern is that a disproportionate amount of uh, hostile action comes out of these countries. And, and let's take, let's pull the Band-Aid off from this faith and how do you respond to that because I, I'm going to say something that I don't want to offend you all with but, uh, but just um, it, it's, a, it's a comment that always or a theme that is beneath the surface and that is we're not sure whether or not Muslim Americans if they see something that they're going to say something because are they American first or are they Muslim first? Well, many terror plots have been broken up by family members, by parents, by mothers, by fathers who call law enforcement. We saw the case in the Bay Area where a father called the FBI on his son. And so this happens, and this doesn't get media coverage, you know, but this does happen. Now, we have to look at the numbers. The data is there. How many from these countries, the seven countries that were named, how many have killed Americans here? In a, a, zero. Zero. Now, we look at other countries that have killed Americans, and they're not even on the list. You're talking about, I assume you're talking about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt. And, and if you look at those countries, um, they weren't placed on the list, but they have business interests um, with, with Trump. And so you know, many people have called them out for that. Why weren't those countries placed on the those list? Are, those are strong words. So you're insinuating that that's the reason that they're not on the list? I'm, I mean, it's on him to prove otherwise. Why, why weren't those countries on the list where those countries had individuals that harmed this country while the seven that were named, it was done for political reasons. Um, not one individual from those countries harmed our country and yet they're, the, they're being barred. And those are the folks, and, and, and those are the folks that, you know, they're fleeing war, they're fleeing terrorism. And, um, and we even have individuals um, from Iraq who served with the U.S. military um, that are being denied um, entrance, where we have generals getting involved now, saying, no, these are folks that worked with us, that, that saved our lives, that, you know, that, and that put their families in risk, and now they're trying to enter the country and we're denying them um, their visas. Cheryl, when you, when you hear Bassam's words, how do you react to the notion that people are, be that these actions are taking place and coming back to your earlier statement about your family, what's, what is it that you think that all the people joining us, watching this program, really need to know? Well, I think, first of all, any time you put a large group of people into one category and call them something, that in itself is a problem. And I like to feel like I'm living proof of that, that you can't look at me and know who I am. You can't look at Maheen and think you know who she is. She's a human being. The fact that um, we have our government leading in an effort like this is really scary and disheartening. But I'll tell you the good thing about it. The really good thing that I feel today that uh, makes me feel better about this is the number of people that come together, different types of people that come together to support each other and help each other in the community, and in particular in Sacramento, but you see it across the nation. And also that this time, we do seem to have political leadership who is standing up. And I really appreciate that and think we need to support that. Um, we don't, you know, the, our president, we don't have a dictatorship. He's not a dictator. I think that we, uh, democracy is active and we need to participate in it. And that's what I learned from my family experience, is that if you want democracy to work, 
You need to participate in it. And if it doesn't work for you, but it works for me, that's not democracy. If it has to work for all of us, and we can make change, I think we can make change. Maheen, you have three other sisters that are younger than you, mm -hmm. right? What is it that their experience is like right now? Do they, do they talk to you about this? Yeah, so I mean, I would go back to the day right after elections where the next morning my sister who's 11, I had to um, tell her in the morning before she went to school that you know if anyone bullies her, if anyone says anything to her, um, that she should you know talk to her teacher and don't let anybody you know say anything racist to her because that's something that I was afraid would happen and especially since she also knew at least for an 11 year old you know what this presidency would mean and what he's been saying about the Muslim community so that was very much a difficult conversation for me to have with her but one that I had to just to make sure that you know I'm helping her understand step what's back going on. from from the discussion of the mm -hmm. presidency for for a moment right now okay go back you know for whatever period of time you want on a day-to-day -day basis, is life different for you as a Muslim woman in this country than your non-Muslim friends experience? Yes, definitely, definitely. I think it's the emotional, mental trauma also that goes with what's happening in our nation. You're thinking about it on a daily basis. You're trying to do the work that you're doing, you know, um, but at the same time you have this feeling of what's happening to my Muslim community. What am I, what can I do to help support them with the roles that I have in place? And what can we do to resist what's happening? You know, so I think these are things that actually do go through my head every single day to see how we can support our communities from something even worse happening, right? We're seeing what's happening now, but things can get worse. Uh, but you are a success story. Uh, you, you come from what, that you've shared with us is a great family. You're a graduate of UC Davis. Mm -hmm. You were student body president or, or... For the Muslim Student Association. For the yes. Muslim Student Association. Uh, you work in the legislature today. Uh, you, uh, uh, someone might say, well, nothing's held you back. Your American experience is better than a lot of other folks. And I think I do recognize my privilege in that. Um, having our faith be the major issue that's currently being you know talked about doesn't say that economically um, I haven't been privileged right I think my family my background um, everything that's led me to where I am right now the education that I have uh, that's something that I do think you know as an American I've been blessed and privileged to have at the same time though what's going on currently with the Muslim community is actually making that difficult. Students are going to school now and they're afraid of hate crimes that will happen on campus. That's affecting them emotionally, which affects their academic well-being on campus. Are there hate crimes happening on campus? So UC Davis, where um, I went to school, they had a vandalism of their mosque, which is literally almost on campus. And there was someone, it's all caught on video footage of someone slashing tires of bikes, smashing all the windows and the doors and leaving bacon on the door handle. And someone like me, who is very much attached to the Davis community, and my younger sister, who's now vice president for the Muslim Student Association, this was this impacted us greatly. I have family and friends all over Facebook in real life, you know, talking about just how shocking it was that this could happen at UC Davis, you know, somewhere where you think that the community was really supportive. Bassam, you know, you're a, you're a parent. You have friends that are parents. As parents, what are the fears and concerns that are discussed when members of the community are together? You know, unfortunately, with some of these incidents that, that have taken place around the country with, with Oak Park um, or the African American church in the South that was, that was attacked, um, these incidents do occur. And so we do have to address safety in the community. Uh, we've worked very closely with law enforcement um, to address safety issues in the community. Now, for having four children, um, you know, um, we, we, we've been trying to shut. How do you feel? Um, it's, um, it's, it's a constant worry, you know, for my family and, and our nation and where we're heading and, and, the sa and, and the safety of individuals. I mean, unfortunately, there, there, people have been killed 
Um, and not all of it makes national news, but there have been many incidents around the country. And it's not only targeting uh, the Muslim community. Um, it's targeting the African American and Latino and other communities out there. And so this is something, this is, I believe, a battle for the soul of this nation. Which direction is this nation heading, in, heading into? And, and we're trying to resolve the issues that the 1964 Civil Rights Act did not finish. Hate did not go away. Hate was just swept under the rug. And now, we finally, it's out there. We see it. We identify it. And we can address it. And really, a lot of it is education. Uh, bring, you know, and, and, and Americans working together. We need conservatives today to be real conservatives uh, in addressing these issues. Um, and, and so, and this is where, if we, if we unite and work together, we can make a difference. Do you feel, though, that the policy position of trying to defend America, Americans, and our border, our borders, is it, that whole notion in that policy plank is inherently racist? Well, it is. If we had, it is. If we had terrorists, if we had, we every country has to secure its borders. If we had one terrorist slip through that border, then I can say yes. But if it's just used for 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 to get to win votes. And unfortunately, in a lot of these elections, we saw that Obama was a Muslim, um, that um, this candidate is going to make gay marriage, you saw in 2000 where it was the LGBT issue. They're using these issues at times when it wasn't even on the ballot in many of those states, but they use it to win over votes. And so we see the wall, the ban, all that was just to give votes. You know, had there been real, you know, we look at what the security experts say. We look at folks in the FBI, Homeland Security. Um, we look at what they have to say, not what our politicians necessarily have to say. They're the experts in these fields. I think we can be smarter about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just think as a country, we have a lot of really smart well, well, people. Well, let me, we well, let me ask you the question. This is let very me have, thinly veiled. Right, I agree but with you. But let me ask you the question. You know, uh, there have been discussions about refugees from Syria. Is it really unreasonable to want to make sure that uh, people coming in from another country that are refugees are are not among them terrorists or have have inherent yeah. intent to harm this country. Well, here's the thing, and I think I want to go back to what was mentioned about the wall and refugees. All of this together, we're seeing complete like full communities being told that they're criminals, right? You're criminalizing them. The stereotypes that are being created is happening to Latinos. It's been happening. It's been happening to the black community as well. And now it's happening to the Muslim community and to refugees. There already is a process in place for immigration, right? There's a process that is very long. People have been waiting years. And now, you know, when it's their moment that for some people that they can actually come, they're not able to. And there haven't been, I mean, statistically, in terms of crime rates, we're seeing crime rates from white supremacists, white supremacists, but we haven't been seeing the question asked to them, will you, you know, if you see something, will you say something? But that's being asked of Muslims and of refugees. You feel like your entire community is being sort of demonized as a criminal community. I think so. And currently with this ban, and I think in the future too, with the rhetoric that's being used, definitely. Where do you think this goes, Basim? You know me, I'm always optimistic, but I'll tell you, I, you know, I, I am very concerned about where this nation is heading um, right now. And if our country, if our country doesn't unite, well, I'm talking about conservative, conservatives, liberals, and to protect our democracy, th this, this experience of America is, is in real trouble right now. And, um, and so, and, and going back to the refugee issue, talking about vetting, you ask any security expert. The vetting, the, the system is there and the system works. We're talking about so many different agencies, the FBI, Homeland Security, and, and multiple times as well. And so this is an 18 to 24 month process. And you'll ask any security official and they'll tell you the system works. There's a system in place. We know what we're doing. Um, but despite that, you know, they're, they're saying that we have, to, we, have to look, we have to come up with a new system. There's been a, there's been an, a, a notion that, uh, to come back to my earlier question, there is a notion that somehow the Muslim community isn't doing enough on, on these issues. That they're not stepping up, and I'm, but they're not stepping up in the way that, say, the Japanese community did during World War II. What do you say to that? I, I don't think that that's true. And um, Scott, you know, I'm a reluctant uh, person to be speaking out and in the spotlight, but I just really feel that it's time to speak out. Um, uh, I don't think that it's uh, any different than during World War II. 
I mean, I think that the racism is there that um, I, I would like to see, and the reason that I'm speaking is instead of the Muslim community to, out of fear, fear breeds fear, kind of go internal and inside themselves, to be more open to, I mean, you see all the support you get from all across the communities and to actually reach out and know other people. And that's kind of what I would say to people, if, if you don't know a Muslim, reach out and learn about a person. Don't um, brush people with one broad stroke like all Muslims are this or all Muslims should be doing this or behaving this way or look this way or talk this way or act this way. Muslims are people. We're kind of all people. I would like to see um, people getting to know each other and then the fear goes away and I think that's how you fight the fear. Incidentally, most Muslims in the world do not come from the Middle East, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But the stereotype is that a Muslim comes from the Middle East and wears a hijab. And we're going to leave it there. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.